Ads are everywhere, aren't they? Uh, We're inundated with them as soon as we leave our homes. Billboards, signs, decals on other cars. Uh, They even started painting ads on sidewalks in case you're only looking down as you go. Passing out flyers. Plus, they've broken their way into our homes as well. Any show we watch on TV, cable, or all the streaming channels now. Uh, E-readers have them to help you find another book to buy and read. Scrolling as you do on social media, you can't help but see ad after ad. And in the mail. I know Jess and I basically only really get advertisements in the mail. Um, And that's not a pitch uh, to send us mail. Somebody asked me that in the first service. Uh, It's just how it is. We we send texts and emails, I guess, uh, for most of our communication. But last week's kind of the, the, the high point for ads, isn't it? The Super Bowl. Some watch like I do to see a good game. Some watch for a halftime show. Some watch uh, to see the drama this year of, uh, or the involvement of Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey, see what goes on there. Some just watch the game because the people around them are wanting to watch and they want to join in. But there are people that watch it just for the ads. That's the whole reason they tune in. You don't have to raise your hand if that's you this morning. We know you're out there uh, somewhere, but... It's a time of ads, right? Ads are a big deal. The average cost for a 30-second slot in the Super Bowl is $7 million. Companies spend big. They spend time. They spend their creativity, their best people, all competing for attention with the ads they come out with. The hope being to win the competitions of best ad or be something that's remembered. Ads seek to sell us something, a product, a service, an experience. They strive to convince us that we have a need and that we have a need that their product, service, or experience is a solution, in fact, the best solution to meet. One common theme I've seen in ads recently has been a push to sell various things as a means of escaping the stresses, the noises, the dangers, the uncertainties of life. It could be a cruise or to relax and recharge to avoid burnout at work. It could be a closet system that's so ordered that it just brings comfort and order to the midst of your chaotic family scheduling. It could be a bathroom remodel that can construct an in-home oasis that you can escape whatever's gone on outside the walls. You come home, go into the bathroom, soak in the tub, and relax. Even luxury SUVs are out there now as uh, being referred to directly in ads as sanctuaries, as places that help us to escape beyond this world, escape past all the stuff that we can't help uh, but deal with as we go about our lives. Today our text is set at Israel's special place that they would go in order to deal with the anxieties and pressures of the world the temple. We continue our series in the Gospel of John. The first half of this book shows Jesus appearing at various important Jewish events. Last week, beginning with the celebration of the wedding feast, today the going to the temple at the time of the Passover. At these big events, the second thing we see is that Jesus speaks about or performs a sign using symbols that are associated with that event for the Jews in order to help reveal more about himself and his character to those around him. Last week was using the purification jars and making new wine. Next, he then goes on to provide an abundance of something the event promises. Again, last week, the better new wine, save it for the end, that he provided. And then finally, we see people responding to Jesus' self-revelation and all that he's said and done, often, though, through general misunderstanding. Again, the disciples last week believed in him, but most never knew that Jesus even had done this. The ceremony master, the groom, everyone didn't know, and they all thanked the groom and his family for providing the wine. This pattern that we see in the Gospel of John is going to be our framework this morning. Our framework seeing of what Jesus is revealing as he cleanses the temple. Beginning first with the event, going to the temple at Passover. Moving on then to what Jesus does there and the symbols he uses. Third, the abundance he provides. And finally, the response to it. So before we dive into our text and read it, we need to first understand and remind ourselves a little of the temple in Jerusalem and what it would signify to the people there. After all, today it could be hard for us to grasp just the role and importance the temple would have for a Jew in Jesus' day because we don't really have anything like it anymore. And as we'll see today, that's quite all right. But we need to put ourselves in their shoes for just a moment to begin to understand the magnitude of the scene. Like the tabernacle before it, the temple was the center of life for the Jew in the first century. Beyond its primary religious functions, the government of the Jews, brokered, of course, by the Roman occupation authorities, would meet there. As did the judicial courts for the Jewish people. As did uh, the taxation that would happen. This was a place that would set the moral, the political, the religious tone for the whole rest of the nation of Israel. 
and all throughout the Old Testament and again uh, in the intertestamental period with Judas Maccabeus onto the Romans of Jesus' day and the Zealot Revolt after him, history shows us that people saw the importance of the temple and recognized conquering it first as paramount to winning public enthusiasm and support. So in Jesus' day, the Antonia Fortress overlooking the temple at its northwest corner was fortified and built up by the Romans so that they were able to keep watch over it and make sure that it was orderly and not beginning any sort of uprising against them. To get an idea of the attitude, the mindset somebody might have of the temple, Psalm 84 begins in verses 1 to 2, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. There was a deep desire, a deep delight, an enjoyment for the Jew, something special and sacred for them to go to the temple to go before the Lord their God. In Solomon's prayer dedicating the temple in 1 Kings 8, Solomon praises that it is now the special place where God's glorious presence will dwell, that Israel's chosen people uh, is now marked by this temple that God is with them and he reigns over them. Specifically asking that when we turn our prayers to you in this place, hear us. Hear me, hear the people, hear us when we turn our prayers to this place. God's presence with them would bring them blessing and hope for their future. The temple was a place where people could come and pray and God would hear them. Would hear them. It was a place for crying out over injustices they were experiencing. For casting all their worries upon him. For petitioning God to help in times of trouble or need. It was also a place of joyous celebration and festivities. Carrying out there to remind and thank Uh, to remind people and thank God and praise him for all he has provided and all he has done for them. And finally, sacrifices were made here to make atonement for sin, to evidence their relationship with him, that he is a living God among them, and to offer up sweet fragrances as praise offerings. And so this temple meant everything to the Jew. It was the center of national and religious pride for the people of Israel. So when it's destroyed in 586 BC as the nation of Judah is carried off into exile, it's a crushing blow. The hope becomes and steadily builds that one day the temple might be restored. And at the end of Ezra 3, we see the older priests, the older Levites, and the heads, the older heads of the households weeping as the temple has been rebuilt, for it does not even come close to marvel the grandeur that the old temple had provided. There must have been great joy and hope at this point, though, because around 20 BC, Herod the Great begins the rebuilding program of the temple in order to help it rival its former self. Now that we've looked a little of the event, going to the temple, that even doesn't say much about the Passover being a special time to remember how God is provided by rescuing the people of Israel from captivity in Egypt. We've seen now what the event is, a little bit about it. Let's dive into what Jesus does. If you haven't yet, open your Bibles to John chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 13 through 22. And as I do, I want you to listen and be on the lookout for the symbols that Jesus uses that are associated otherwise with the temple. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers, and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these away, do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Again, the scene is the Passover at the temple, a major festival. Jesus enters it, a place of prayer, purification, going before God in worship. And in the first half of this startling scene, Jesus finds merchants selling oxen, sheep, and pigeons, all symbols of the sacrificial system God had instituted to be carried out at the temple, as well as money changers, all conducting business within the temple grounds. We're told that Jesus then fashions a whip out of cords, likely with straws meant to care for the animals there, and uses it to drive out the merchants, drive out their livestock. He takes the coins of the money changers and pours it out, overturns their tables. He commands the pigeon owners to take their cages and go. Now, this isn't the only temple cleansing mentioned in the Gospels. Uh, Matthew 21, Mark 11, and Luke 19 all have very similar accounts of a temple cleansing. Uh, But John's account differs in a number of ways. 
For starters, it, it differs in the placement. John here is showing this at the beginning of the account of Jesus' ministry, while the other Gospels show it near the end. Commentators, after studying the differences, looking at the similarities, because there are both, generally hold one of two views. One, that Jesus cleansed the temple at least two separate times, if not more. Once here in John, once again in at the end that's recorded in the other Gospels, or that Jesus cleansed it once and John rearranges it at this point for a theological emphasis on revealing who God is at the start of his ministry. Both have good arguments. We don't have time to go deep into it today, and so we can't really know for certain. And so what we're going to do is just stick to John's account to see specifically why John is highlighting the details that he highlights, what he's trying to communicate, and how he's using the story and what Jesus revealed to help us see who Jesus is. But when reading the story, one can still struggle with what to make of it, right? Was Jesus being violent or aggressive? What does that mean for us? Should we downplay the use of force that seems to be here? Should we just, again, remind ourselves, God is love, Jesus is love, and forget about that force, forget about the seeming violence that goes on? Jesus' actions in this text are indeed forceful, but they're not cruel. He rises up and he does drive out the merchants. He doesn't seem to suggest or try to argue or reason with them, with the merchants, money changers, and definitely not with the animals. He, he causes enough of a commotion that the people around him take notes and ask him about it. But we also don't see evidence that his actions caused the Roman soldiers overlooking the temple from that fortress to intervene, which they certainly would have if they saw a riot breaking out. Nor did the temple guards arrest or expel him, which they certainly would have if they felt his actions had broken their laws. And neither did the people who were there witnessing this rebuke him. Instead, they asked him for a sign to show his authority to act like this, seemingly to suggest that they could see or at least could begin to hint at seeing that there was some truth or validity in this action of Jesus in seeing these sellers returning the temple, the house of God, into a place of trade. John chapter 2 provides a lot of good reasons, it would appear, for the merchants and money changers to be there. After all, people would make long, difficult journeys to reach the temple, even harder when you have to carry extra animals with to make sacrifice. The temple also wanted only one specific type of silver coin used to pay the annual half-shekel tax for the males over 20 in order to ensure the purity of the silver. So Jews would join in pairs to pay the tax together in one coin. Yet, there were multiple currencies in the surrounding regions, and so conversion from those to this special coin were necessary. Since it's the Passover time, even more animals and more conversions were necessary to address the larger crowds of people flocking to the city to celebrate. It's generally agreed that the presence of these merchants and animals and money changers in the temple, probably in the court of the Gentiles, where that red arrow is you see up on the screen there, again, the furthest outside parts, not even in the inner parts, but the outermost area in the court of the Gentiles, this likely was only a temporary thing, not permanent likely there to address the larger crowds, the influx of people to provide more animals, more money services to more people quickly. They offer a service, at least it appears, that seems to be both convenient for those coming to worship and helps to ensure the quality or the purity of what the worship is being carried out, the purity of the silver, the quality of the animal. Nothing is said here about greed or corruption. So then what is Jesus' issue that he takes with him? His words were, do not make my father's house a house of trade. Their presence, their actions are in some way preventing the temple from functioning as God intended. Going before God is being limited. It's being distracted by the presence of these merchants, the animals, the coins clinging and clanging as they're transacted. Jesus wants there to be pure worship and the right relationship with God at the place that God had specifically designed as the focal point for that relationship to be carried out. Even if it's in the court of the Gentiles, the outermost area, that's still the only place the Gentile could go and worship. And God wants all people to come to know him, to worship him, to follow him. We see that perfect outward form and convenience of the worshiper are not the most essential elements in going before God in worship and prayer. Rather, Jesus calls for pure worship from our hearts. It is to be respected, worship is, to be carried out from a person's heart, but on God's, not our own terms. This is what Jesus is passionate for. This is what he shows great zeal and energy and enthusiasm for. In fact, the disciples see Jesus' actions here and immediately or soon after recognize these words from Psalm 69.9, zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal seems to be the focus here and what is triggering that connection for the disciples, but that word consume is important too. 
Jesus is so focused, so committed to serving God, to living for him, to worshiping him, to committing to carry out his will, that he will do so time and time again at the expense of himself, ultimately giving up his own life on the cross to redeem his people. Again, at the end, the Jews asked for a sign that shows Jesus' authority for being able to do all of this. And what Jesus offers is a scenario that is really a foreshadowing of what is to come. Jesus says that if the temple were to be destroyed, he would rise it up, raise it up again in three days. Here, Jesus uses the temple itself as a symbol of who he is and what he's there to do. At this point, the temple has been in Herod's rebuild program for 46 years, we're told in the text. But we know from history that it still has about three decades to go before its final completion around 63 AD. Which means that although the inner parts were probably done, there was work still to go. And so the shock over such a quick rebuild of something that took so long is understandable. Since the Jews there hearing as well as John tells us even the disciples, they miss what Jesus is talking about and how he's talking about himself. But thankfully, John puts this note in so that us as readers today do not miss what Jesus said and can recognize it and begin to see what he's saying. First, we had the event of going to the temple at Passover. And then we had the, what Jesus did using the symbols of sacrificial worship and atonement, as well as equating himself to the temple, the place where God was with his people. Now we'll move on to reflecting on the abundance that Jesus provides. After forming a covenantal relationship and promises with, with Abraham, Moses, and David, the temple is now there as, we're, as the place where God dwells among his people, identifying them as his and him as their God. And so people would make sacrifices to atone their sins. Priests would be at the temple to carry out their duties, interceding between God and the rest of the people. Their God was worshipped, their God was praised, and their God was. The temple provided all these things to Israel, but Jesus is beginning to reveal here that he is now in the process of providing them all of that in greater abundance in himself. The temple is being replaced and fulfilled in Jesus as the new temple. Before going to the cross, Jesus institutes communion as an ordinance that remembers the new covenant made in his blood. After all, we're told Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. As John already said in chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word, which is Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That dwelt among us is tabernacled among us, with us in the same manner, the same way as the tabernacle was among the people, as the temple was among the people, now Jesus, the word, is like that among his people. Jesus is the final and the perfect sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 14 says, For by a single offering, Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. We don't need to continually offer sacrifices. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus is also the ultimate high priest, the ultimate intercessor or minister on our behalf. Again, in Hebrews chapter 14, verses 14 to 16, read, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us, with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Instead of needing to go to the temple to have a priest intercede before us, Jesus is now there allowing us to have direct access to God. We don't need an intercessor anymore. We can go directly to him in prayer. Instead of the temple as the specific place to meet with God, John will also tell us soon that of Jesus speaking to the woman at the well in John 4 that worship is now here and done to be, and to be carried out in spirit and in truth. This is a messianic and prophetic work of Jesus, transforming what worship and sacrifice looked like it would mean for all eternity. All that the temple promised, all that the temple was intended to do, is fulfilled in and now replaced by Jesus. We see this again in John's vision of, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, where, we, where John reports that, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. In the new heavens and the new earth, the temple is no longer needed, because God the Father and God the Son are the temple. They are with us. They are interceding for us. And the sacrifice has been paid once and for all in the blood of Christ. We saw the event. We saw what Jesus did, the symbols of the temple he uses to reveal who he is and what he is there to do. We see how he provides in abundance all that the temple could ever have promised, far greater than it could ever do. Now let's consider the response to what Jesus reveals. 
John leaves the Jews is not understanding what Jesus is saying about himself and the tem- as the temple. Remember, they're still thinking that it's the physical temple, 46 years into a rebuild. He acknowledges, John does, that both he and the rest of the disciples don't really understand what Jesus was saying either until after Jesus raises from the dead. Presumably then the Holy Spirit helps them understand more clearly and grasp all Jesus has said and done in his time with them. So as is common in John and his gospel, we see that Jesus' signs, his teaching, what he's revealed about himself is too great for uh, them to understand and generally misunderstood. But John gives that note for his readers, for us, so that we don't miss it. So that we can be looking as we continue reading for how this plays out, how this develops, and we can recognize who Jesus is. We will see in our text next week that there are people in Jerusalem beginning to believe in Jesus. It just takes more signs and more wonders performed by Jesus to reveal that to them. The responses John shows us in this text are meant to help get you and I today even thinking of our response to what Jesus reveals about himself. If you're here this morning not yet a believer or follower of Jesus, this text is seeking to show you who he is. It's showing you that Jesus is God with us. He is the final perfect sacrifice offered to make you clean and whole again. He is the great high priest able to sympathize with you in any weakness, any trial, any struggle. He enables you to receive mercy and grace from God himself. Jesus is the temple where you can now meet with God directly. So ask yourself this morning, do I see who Jesus is? Am I seeing who Jesus is revealing himself to be? And am I ready to believe and trust in him and follow him? If you are, or if you're questioning or have more that you want to know about that, don't leave today without that. Pray to God right now in your seat. Turn to those around you. Find me or somebody else after the service and talk with us. If you are a follower of Jesus here this morning, we too are called to see how Jesus is revealing who he is using the temple imagery. We're to examine our own ideas, our own views of worship, to make sure we are aligned with God's instruction on it rather than our own approaches, like the merchants, the money changers, or the temple leaders of the day who allowed it to happen. We can ask ourselves questions like, do I view my worship as really only happening when I sing songs? I worship and sing, and then somebody announces something, and then somebody talks for a while, and then I worship God some more. Or do we see all of what we do at church as a time of worship? Seeing ways that we could partner together with other organizations and spread the gospel. Seeing ways that we can uh, come together and grow closer to God in our knowledge of him and with one another as his people. We can also say, is my worship something limited to only being done for an hour or two on Sundays at church? Is worship just a sporadic thing that comes and goes in my life, or is it something that is here each and every day through every part of my life? Are there areas in our lives that we might separate off or not yet offer to God in our relationships with him? And if so, what would it look like to give that area over to God as an act of worship today? And more and more like that. Romans 12:1 says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Our worship looks different. We don't have to go to this church building to worship. We don't have to journey to Jerusalem, to the temple, in order to worship. We don't have to go anywhere. We could worship him right where we are, offering our bodies as a living sacrifice to him. Time and time again, it's not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing thing, holy and acceptable to him, and that is our spiritual worship. Hear Jesus' plea for wholehearted worship, for following him with our all, We must be careful not to set hoops for ourselves or for the others around us to have to jump through before worshiping. Things like having the right look, uh, wearing the right clothes on a Sunday morning. I know that's ironic for me. We wear shorts all the time, but I didn't this morning. I didn't want to cause that problem. But that really is an issue that this sort of text, and I'm not using this text as a way to excuse it either. I don't want you to hear that. We have to think, what does it look like to worship God, and what does it look like to set up boundaries made by man in order to restrict worship or make it more formal or more what we want it to look like rather than what God calls it to look like? Do we have the right style of music the band is playing? Are there the right classes being offered for me to worship God at Sunday school? Are there uh, the perfect execution of all the events happening at church Or am I in the right mood to worship him at home? Or is the driver in front of me treating me well enough and not cutting me off so I could then worship God as I'm driving? All these questions, all these things we might add in that, ah, that happened, I can't worship him right now. I'm distracted, I'm going to do that later. There are multiple distractions that we have that we can also pursue avoiding in order to go to God and worship him directly and well. Things like having boundaries on our phone or prioritizing God over our work, our sports, the fun things we do. 
not letting the pressures of holding up our outward image, our outward reputation, keep us from being open and genuine to God and our need for him, or our f- open and genuine to our fellow believers to encourage them. At the start of our time together, I mentioned ads and how they try to show us a need we have and then sell us a solution to meet that need. But their solutions are always only temporary. Products wear and break down, services will come to an end, experiences fade and are forgotten. Then you have to buy it or an upgraded version of it again and again and again. In Jesus, the new and better temple, we have a permanent solution to our greatest needs. He is our final perfect sacrifice, our great high priest, the one who guarantees never-ending access to God. We need only to believe in him and then follow him with our whole hearts. Let us pray. Oh God, we love you. We thank you that you reveal yourself to us in your word, reveal yourself to us in creation. You let us to know you and experience you, and you call us to recognize who you say you are. And in this text, Lord, you are saying that you are the replacement and fulfillment of the temple, that you are there to enable us to worship directly and in ways that were not previously there. Lord, you show us what it looks like to live a life of worship. May we live lives wholly dedicated to you, O God. We know that all we need to do to be saved by you, Jesus, is is to put our faith in you, that in Christ alone our hope is found. And that's what we'll sing about in a moment, and that's what we want to take away, knowing that we do not earn our salvation with the ways that we carry out checklist worship or other things, Lord, but instead we worship you with our hearts as a response to you revealing who you are. In the Son, Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.